Mm-hmm. So, uh, we are very happy to have Professor Malik Parikh from Arizona State University uh, today for giving this talk, The Noise of Gravitons. So, uh, Malik is well known to most of us. He's a renowned expert on gravity, string theory, and many other things. He happens to be our, what is called the SERV Vajra faculty at IIT Gandhinagar. But we don't know when he is going to come here again. Okay, hopefully soon. So, let's start, Malik. Okay, well, um, thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure to give this colloquium to, at IIT. It's very interesting that now we have this whole, uh, these Zoom colloquia uh, and I think the attendances are often quite good because people are logging in from all over the world. Of course, we have these technical problems as well. Um, so the talk, I'm going to uh, my, the title of my talk, as you can see, is The Noise of Gravitons, and I hope you can see this animation. Uh, and it's really, by the end of the talk, you will hopefully understand what this animation is about. Um, but before I talk about gravity, let me tell you a little bit about... Um, hold on, can I... Is it still, sh can I, is it still sharing? No, it is not. Or am I... Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Okay. Um, and let me pull up my Zoom window. Yeah. So uh, let me tell no, you a little. Share, share again. No, no, I, I want to just uh, speak without uh, window, uh, without any images. Um, so I want to tell you about uh, a story about electrodynamics, actually. Uh, and the, so as you know, well, about light, actually. So if you, if you hold a light bulb, and you look at it from further and further away, then the bulb, auto, of course, becomes dimmer and dimmer. And you can go very far away and the bulb will correspondingly get even dimmer. But at some point, something quite remarkable happens, which is that if you go very far away from the bulb, then the light will cease to get dimmer and dimmer. Instead, what will happen is your the bulb will, you will see complete darkness punctuated by, uh, oh, can you not hear my audio? Yes, we can. There are complaints about the audio. Okay. Um, is, is, it, is this all right? Can everyone hear me? All right, good. Uh, so, what I was saying was, if you look at a light bulb from afar, then as you get further and further away, uh, it gets dimmer, at, obviously. But at some point, something quite remarkable happens, that, which is that the, the bulb, you won't see it at all, it'll be completely uh, dark. And, they'll, and instead, instead of the bulb getting dimmer and dimmer in a continuous way, you'll see flashes of light. The, the darkness will be, the complete pitch darkness will be punctuated by uh, flashes of light. And um, as you go further, even further away, the flashes will become more infrequent. They won't change in their, uh, in their brightness, uh, but they, they will change in their, they will reduce in, um, in their frequency. And what these flashes are, of course, are photons. And, uh, and what this, elementary experiment is telling us is that light, which we perceive as an electromagnetic wave, is actually a quantum field whose quanta are photons. So uh, that's the um, story for the electromagnetic field. So even though uh, the classical electromagnetic field is described by Maxwell's equations, and even though we have, um, we have a wave equation describing uh, light, at some point, the, there's an underlying hidden reality of it, which is that it's really a quantum field. And in fact, you can uh, uh, see the quantumness of light very simply. Uh, here's my uh, iPhone, uh, ignore the cracked screen. Uh, what's really interesting is, uh, is at the back, there's a camera. Uh, and if you take a picture at very low light of something quite dark, uh, then 
and you look at and you zoom in not at your subject but at sort of the dark areas of the screen, what you'll find are the, is that it won't be completely black, but there'll be little dots, little uh, flash, little grain, uh, and those dots are basically um, uh, well, there. What what has happened is that in the very little amount of time that your uh, shutter is open, there's a little bit of light that comes through. And if you have a 12 megapixel sensor, then on each pixel, there are only a handful uh, of photons coming in. And you can actually work out how many photons come in in the uh, short period of time. And if there are only a handful of photons coming in, then, uh, then, um, uh, then, then any little fluctuation of that will be, qu will be quite visible. Uh, and so, so basically with your phone, you can actually detect the presence of uh, photons. Uh, and by the way, it works with Android as well. Um, so, so that's a way of de de determining that uh, light is an electromagnetic field of pain. Okay. All right. Let me go back to my uh, screen again. Um, and uh, I'll go to here. And the, the study of, um, of the electromagnetic field as a, a quantum field was really pioneered by this uh, fantastic papers, uh, this paper and another paper by uh, Roy Glauber in 1963. Um, and uh, Roy Glauber won the Nobel Prize in 2005. And he's really the uh, person who originated the field of quantum optics. So what, what this, uh, these papers show is how uh, our classical view of light as an electromagnetic wave uh, matches up with the quantum, quantum field, theoretic, field theoretic description of uh, a state in Hilbert space or in Fox space, which, has, um, which is made up of photons. So what exactly is that relationship? So this was worked out here. So to summarize, um, we, I uh, hope somebody's drawing on my screen. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to summarize, what we have are that uh, electromagnetic fields are uh, quantum fields whose quanta are photons, okay? And the photons reveal themselves in situations with very low photon numbers. So you really can be aware of this kind of graininess in your photographs uh, when there's low light. And, though, and at low light, you can actually make out that there's fluctuations in the number of photons. And these fluctuations appear as random fluctuations. There's, there's kind of a pattern of a speckle in your photographs. Uh, and they're noise. Uh, noise not, of course, uh, in an auditory sense, but noise in the sense of signal to noise. The random fluctuations. And in this case, the randomness is actually coming from quantum mechanics. So there's quantum mechanical probabilities that induce uh, randomness in uh, the number of photons. OK? So that's the story for the electromagnetic waves. And the purpose of this talk uh, is to tell you about some work in which we try to ask ourselves the same question for gravity. And our idea, the, the question we wanted to ask was, uh, we, well, gravity also is, is in many ways quite similar to the electromagnetic field. Uh, it, gravitational waves obey the wave equation. Uh, there are classical equations, Einstein's equations that are akin to Maxwell's equations in some sense. Um, and just as electromagnetic waves are made up of photons, we wanted to know, um, you know, we, we expect that gravitational um, waves are made up of gravitons. And the question is, how do we detect or how would we perceive in what uh, gravitons and in what way would they become manifest? Uh, and so uh, this is this, uh, the paper that I have uh, here is uh, Noise of Gravitons. This is an essay we wrote and uh, it won a prize this year the, uh, in this annual Gravity Research Foundation competition. Uh, and this is in collaboration with my uh, two collaborators here, Frank Wilczek um, at MIT and my postdoc, uh, George Zahariade at Arizona State University. And he's uh, about to go to Barcelona. And uh, so besides this paper here, uh, there are also uh, two more, um, more technical papers, a short paper called The Quantum Mechanics of Gravitational Waves, which hopefully will come out soon. Uh, and also a longer one called Signatures of the Quantization of Gravity at Gravitational Wave Detectors. 
Okay. So uh, what we're going to do in, in this talk is I, I want to try to motivate to you uh, how it is that um, that graviton that the underlying graviton nature of the quantized nature of the gravitational field will manifest itself in uh, experiment. So in order to do that, I have to tell you about gravity. This is a colloquium. I assume most of you know the standard story about, uh, but let me just uh, tell you the, uh, the parts that are actually relevant for this talk. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, facts about gravity is that if you drop, let's say, uh, two stones uh, that, uh, that are here on the left, uh, falling towards the earth, they'll fall radially inwards. And as you can see, they'll get closer and closer together. Okay, because as they fall radially inwards, uh, they're going to obviously uh, get closer to each other. Now, what that looks like in, this is a picture in space. What that looks like in space time is if you release the two rocks at rest, then initially they're at rest. They're not moving in space. They're only moving in time. So there, there were lines that are going only upwards in time and they're sort of parallel. Um, and as uh, as they uh, get pulled towards the Earth, these world lines start converging, okay? So what we have basically is we have two parallel lines that start to converge, all right? Now, we know that in, uh, on a flat piece of paper, if you draw parallel lines, um, we know from the time of Euclid that they don't converge, they'll stay parallel forever. But on a curved non-Euclidean geometry, parallel lines can converge, and here's an example of that on the right, where you can see that if you start out at the equator with two lines, two parallel lines, both going south, they will eventually converge to the south pole. Um, so what this is telling us is that, um, that there's an underlying geometry, which is a curved geometry, just like uh, in, in this picture of the Earth, which is obviously a curved geometry. So the, the, the convergence of these uh, of these uh, world lines, of these paths, these trajectories, is indicative that there's an underlying curved geometry underneath, okay? Um, and so the technical term for this is these path, these um, objects move along trajectories that are called, known as geodesics. And uh, what we have here is that geodesics start converging. There's, a, there, there's an equation called the geodesic deviation equation, uh, which tells you that they, uh, that uh, objects will start, geodesics will start to converge. Uh, so what causes a space-time to curve? It's, uh, as you know, it's, uh, you know, from those trampoline analogies, there's, uh, whenever you have a lot of energy that causes the space-time to curve, uh, and uh, just like, you know, the sun, a sun or a black hole will cause a geometry around it to deform. Now, if you have two objects, both of which are energetic, let's say two uh, orbiting, two black holes, and they're orbiting around each other, then they're basically sloshing around in space, they're causing, uh, they're distorting and churning up space um, by their motion, and that disturbance in space propagates outwards, and that's what appears to us as a gravitational wave. Now, I don't know if you can see this, uh, if you can see this, um, let me try sharing my screen differently. Uh, this way. Uh, oops. And now, uh, oh, can you see this? Can you see the animation? I don't know if people can see the animation. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. So uh, I'll just play that again. So basically, here's an example of uh, two orbiting black holes, and you can see that the geometry around them is being churned up and distorted, and that disturbance travels outwards like a ripple on a pond until it passes uh, through Earth and gets detected. Okay, um, so what does that ripple of space do? Well, uh, the gravitational wave is going to distort space. So in particular, it means that uh, if you have a bunch, if you have these, let's say, ring of satellites, each one of which is just a free-falling satellite and thereby moving on a geodesic, there, the, the passage of the gravitational wave is going to distort the shape of space and therefore the, uh, the geodesic uh, separation of these 
the, the separation of these uh, satellites is gonna change in time. And that's what happens here. Okay, so uh, in this uh, animation, there's a gravitational wave that's going into the screen. Uh, and it's, uh, as it's going into the screen, the, uh, it's distorting invisibly the space uh, um, as, it, as it passes through. And, and these other, and these satellites that are just there uh, free falling through space are uh, stretched and squeezed in this way. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a, 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 a colloquium, not a public lecture. So uh, Shudipto asked me to put some equations in. And, uh, and so here, the, here are some equations. In fact, I'm going to occasionally have quite a lot of equations because it's a mix of a seminar and a, and a colloquium. Uh, so the, the equation that, you, that uh, describes what happens here is, is this uh, geodesic deviation equation. And this, uh, the symbol xi here is the geodesic separation. It's basically how far apart are two free falling objects, okay? So the xi here um, is telling you how far apart uh, they are, and there's a time derivative on them, two time derivatives, which so there's some, some kind of dynamics. And it's determined on the right-hand side by this capital R, this, uh, which is a Riemann tensor, which is uh, a geometric object that encodes the curvature of space-time. And for a gravitational wave, uh, the Riemann tensor is expressible in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, the gravitational wave by the second derivative of that wave. Okay, and combining the first two equations, we get something that schematically looks like the third equation. And this is a very important equation, so please keep this equation in mind. Uh, mathematically, it's known as a Hill equation. But what this equation tells us is the following. Xi is, as I said, the separation of two free-falling particles, how far apart they are. And this equation gives you the dynamics of that separation in terms of a passing gravitational wave, H, Okay, so if H is changing in time, that's going to induce uh, a change in that separation xi, as we saw in the images of the, in, in the animation of the satellites. And now the question we want to ask in this talk, or the question that we asked as we were working on this, our paper, is what is the generalization of this equation when the space-time metric is treated as a quantum field? Number two, uh, I think this book may be available in any bookstore you are in your city. Uh, so what is the generalization of this equation when the space-time metric is treated as a quantum field? Okay, so uh, we were motivated by um, uh, gravitational wave interferometers, uh, in, and so the, the recent discovery of gravitational waves led us to think about, well, maybe this is, maybe these gravitational wave detectors are somehow sensitive to this, so let's see what uh, we can find. And here are two pictures of uh, gravitational wave detectors. There's on the left is, a, is LIGO. And of course, as, as you all know, there's going to be another version, another um, uh, observatory, ground-based observatory in India. And on the right is a, a schematically, uh, is, a, is, a, is a sketch of uh, LISA, which is a planned mission that's going to be in space. And the key thing here is that there are these arms of the gravitational wave uh, of the uh, interferometer, and the lengths of those arms will change as a gravitational wave passes through. And so, essentially, what what these two what these arms do in the case of the LIGO, there are two arms. In the case of LISA, it's a triangle, so there are three arms. Uh, is that the, they're they we're basically just measuring the length as a as a wave passes through. Okay. And in the case of LISA in particular, these three satellites are just Satellites are going to be orbiting uh, the uh, the sun, and so they're uh, going to be free falling, subject only to gravity. That is, uh, and uh, so this is a perfect example of um, of you know uh, basically uh, free falling objects that are going to be. It's exactly the animation that we saw earlier, okay, but with lasers in between that measure the distances. Okay. So how do we go about and ask, answer the question, uh, what happens when, when uh, what happens to, to uh, the geodesic deviation if the metric is a quantum field? 
So here's going to be, so we're, so we're going to start uh, trying to create a model here. And here's our model of a gravitational wave detector. Now, uh, it's the simplest possible gravitational wave detector. It's basically two free falling objects, which can be satellites, let's call them, let's give them mass capital M and little m naught. And they have some uh, separation, geodesic separation xi, given at each of the vector in general, but we will only think of it as a scalar, just the length of it. Uh, and so there's uh, these, we want to look at the dynamics of xi. We want to figure out what happens to xi if the background space-time is actually a quantum field. Okay, and this is really the essence of a gravitational wave detector. It's just two free-falling particles. All right, so uh, to analyze this, we're physicists, so we're going to start by uh, going from first principles here. And a subject like this, you have to start from uh, first principles, otherwise you'll be criticized right away. And so here's our action. Uh, if you know GR, you may recognize this action. Uh, it's, this is the action for, on the, on the first term on the left, the first integral is the Einstein-Hilbert action, which gives you the, which is the action for general relativity. And then there are two other uh, actions given with these uh, Lagrangians that are square roots. Uh, and those correspond, those are the relativistic actions for the two free falling particles. So that's it. This is an action for gravity coupled to two free falling particles. Now I'm going to, uh, for the experts in the talk, I'm, uh, I'm going to, in the audience, I'm going to uh, present a few details. So uh, let me just um, address them a bit. So the way to proceed now is to, we can use Fermi normal coordinates to put one, the heavier particle on a classical trajectory, on a, basically on shell. And then the other particle Y, we parameterize this way with, in terms of T and Psi. Uh, and then in Fermi normal coordinates, the metric takes this particular form. This is a standard expansion akin to Riemann normal coordinates. Uh, and then more, so that, that reduces the, uh, the square root into uh, something simple. Uh, and we can also expand the metric, the, the Einstein-Hilbert action in, in to quadratic order and perturbations, which is relevant in weak gravity, which is always the case for a sufficiently small region. All right, so that gives us this action here. And, uh, and then finally, we can write the metric perturbation, the H, and expand it in Fourier modes. Okay, so when we do all that, we end up with this, uh, so we, we've got this detector xi, okay? The detectors, the only thing we care about the detector is the length of the arm. So that's a, that's a number, xi, all right? Uh, and it's a dependent, and it's, it's a function of time, actually, because it'll change in time. Uh, and so if we focus on a single mode and a single polarization, we are left with this beautifully simple action. Uh, and so this is a detector arm length interacting with a graviton mode. So, uh, and what it corresponds to, you can all recognize this, is the, uh, this is the action uh, for, okay, the, the, the first two terms that depend on Q, those are, that's a Lagrangian of a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, you have one half mq dot squared, that's the kinetic energy, minus one half m omega squared q squared is the potential energy for a harmonic oscillator. The, uh, the geodesic, the arm length, uh, the, or the separation of the two satellites, that's given by one half, the action, that, that appears in the action as one half m naught xi dot squared. And that, of course, is just the Lagrangian of a free particle. And finally, there's a, a coupling between them. Uh, and that coupling is this uh, cubic term, which is a little nasty looking because it has some derivatives of uh, time derivatives as well. Um, but the important thing to note here is that this action is, is actually, this theory is actually very simple. The both Q and Xi appear at no more than quadratic order. And so as a, as a direct consequence of that, as a direct result of that, we're gonna be able to do calculations exactly not just in perturbation theory, but uh, exactly. All right, so um, here's gonna be our strategy. What we wanna do is we wish to calculate the effect of a quantized gravitational field on the gravitational wave detector. Okay, so the, uh, and 
we already have the action. And so we can quantize this theory, right? We can quantize it in any number of ways. We can either uh, promote all the, uh, the terms to operators and quantize it canonically, or we can take out the action that we already have and write it down in a path integral and, and do path integral quantization. And so what is it that we want to calculate? Well, uh, suppose the gravitational field is initially in some state psi. Okay, so we don't know, well, so let's say there's some given state psi. Now, because the field interacts with the detector, um, we don't actually know what the final state of the field is. We don't assume that the field, the, the gravitational field doesn't change. We, we, we allow the state of the, uh, of, of the gravitational field to change. Intuitively, that's because the detector um, both absorbs and emits energy, uh, it exchanges energy with the gravitational field, right? Because initially you have two, two satellites, they're at rest, uh, and, then, uh, and then the wave passes by, they start oscillating, so they've picked up some kinetic energy, but then by the, when the wave leaves, they're back, at re back to rest again. So they both, they gained energy from the, from the wave, from the gravitational wave, and then they gave it back. So the field configuration in general, uh, the gravitational field configuration in general will change in time. And so we won't assume that the final state of the gravitational field of, the, uh, of gravity uh, is known, okay? And now what we, the only thing we have access to is the detector itself. So, so we can't measure the field, the gravitational field itself directly. All we can measure is the distance, the length of, the, the, of this arm uh, in LIGO or the, or the separation of the two satellites. That's the only thing we can measure. We don't have a way of directly measuring uh, the gravitational field. So we wish to calculate that we're going to treat everything very quantum mechanically, even though the detectors, uh, uh, even though the satellites are very heavy and uh, really are classical. At the very end of the calculation, we'll, we'll uh, take a classical limit and, and see what the classical dynamics is. So we want to calculate the classical dynamics of, of the satellites when uh, subject to a quantum field. So, um, um, so in your previous slide, uh, yes. this is proportional to M0. That's right. Yeah, by the principle of equivalence, uh, G is proportional to M0. Okay, yeah. and um, uh, you have uh, you have assumed that you are only talking about one polarization, that is the Q mode, I guess. Uh, well, okay, so um, if I go back here uh, and I look at the last uh, bottommost equation here, which where I have the uh, metric perturbation, uh, that, that's a sum over both um, modes labeled by a wave vector K uh, as well as uh, polarization S, which can be uh, either the plus polarization or the cross polarization. Uh, all those, keeping all those things will just make things more complicated, but we wanted to get the essence of the calculation. Which, so we stuck to plus polarization and uh, for the moment, we have a single mode here, S of omega, but in the end, we will sum over all modes. Okay, okay. And, uh can you say a bit more about the G? I mean, G is proportional to M0, that bit I understand, but uh, is there an expression for G? Yes, there's an expression. I don't uh, have it right in front of me, uh, but it's it has, it depends on uh, uh, M0 uh, and it depends also on uh, Newton's constant, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right, and this, there's also a, um, a, 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 another parameter, a little m here, and you might wonder where that came from. Uh, and that's actually introduced purely for dimensional reasons. It doesn't have any physical meaning and it actually drops out of all calculations. In the end. So that little m is made up of uh, the volume of space in which you, you have to sort of regulate your vo volume of the universe and so you can get a length out of the combination of h bar g and the volume of the universe. Um, so uh, it, it's not physical at all, and it, uh, fortunately it will disappear from all calculations. 
so 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 if i understand correctly your interest is in to obtain the quantum dynamics of the field z yes okay. if i go and back what, to this equation here uh, yeah. i i don't know how to do the pointer here i forgot how to, uh, uh but uh i the the lower the third equation here which is the the geodesic deviation equation um that this equation that's that's on the screen right now is actually the equation for a classical uh wave h and what we want to know is what happens uh so we're going to treat xi at, we're going to eventually treat xi as classical um and we're going to see what is the effect of uh of a quantum wave on a, a quantized wave on a classical detector so i guess the next step would be to do path integral over q and that's how you will get it that's right yeah so that's exactly where we're going okay so uh, uh sorry so uh, sorry i have a question i have a yeah. question uh, in the next slide you show the metric uh, in the next slide uh, Which in the side? previous slide uh, uh, yeah, yeah. or oh, here uh, 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 sorry okay. then, then Please go to one. Ah, yes, in this page, I, yes. uh, it, it looks that trace of metric does not vanish. Trace of metric. So, so I, I, is it okay? What what doesn't vanish? Ah, trace, trace, trace. Uh, ah, name diagonal uh, summation of diagonal element of metric look. Does not ah. look to vanish. No, no. Is okay, so yes, all right. So uh, there's a, a kind of a subtle point here, uh, which is that uh, Fermi normal coordinates are uh, not directly consistent with transverse traceless gauge. Um, so uh, what you can you have to do is uh, you can write down uh, Fermi normal coordinates and simplify the relativistic actions. And then you get a, a particular form, which is actually gauge invariant. Uh, and uh, then from the, then you uh, go back to, uh, and then you use the fact that to leading order in the uh, met in, in perturbation H, the uh, Riemann tensor is also gauge invariant. And so then now you go back to transverse traceless gauge. So, oh. um, mm -hmm. so there, there's there there's a subtlety that. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about it, but but uh, you're absolutely right that uh, that the way it's, uh, in Fermi normal coordinates the the, metro, the perturbation is not um, traceless. Not uh, then not traceless is just a problem of gauge condition. Yes. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Oh, okay, okay. But the traceless or not traceless would be observable, right? Therefore, it should not it should should not depend on the gauge condition. Uh, well, it's not gauge in the sense of um, uh, okay. Let's see. Mm -hmm. If, if, okay, so Fermi normal coordinates are a different coordinate system that is not uh, the, the usual coordinate system that you'd expand, you'd use for, for um, gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. That's because gravitational waves, you would uh, typically want to write them in transverse traceless gauge. And, um, but Fermi normal coordinates are useful for, this, for looking at the separation of two uh, geodesics. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I think this is a technical discussion, which maybe we can take off, uh, c continue later. It's a, uh, and I can pull up the relevant. Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so uh, we wish to calculate the transition probability of the detector. So we're gonna treat the detector initially we're going to treat everything quantum mechanically, but keeping in mind that ultimately we'll take the classical limit for the detector. And by detector, I just mean the separation of the two, uh, the, the arm length of the detector, or equivalently the separation of the two 
um, satellites. Uh, so we wish to calculate the transition probability of the detector to go from some state A, which could be a position eigenstate, if you like, to some other state B uh, in time t. So the position eigenstate of the separation would mean some length. All right. So how do we do that? Well, uh, so this is what we want to calculate. This is the probability uh, of, of the detector going from A to B, state A to state B. And there's a subscript capital psi there, which is the state, the incoming state of the, uh, of the gravitational field. Uh, and as we said, we don't know what the, sum, what the final states are. So, uh, so we have to sum over the final states. Uh, and, uh, and so we, this is the probability that we get. We have uh, uh, the, the combined state of the gravitational field and the detector is written as psi comma a initially, and the final state is f comma b, where f is the final state of the gravitational field, uh, which is as a, again unknown. Okay, and then u of t is some unitary time evolution operator which is obtained from the action that we have. We can use that action to find the corresponding Hamiltonian and uh, U of T is simply the, uh, the usual exponentiation of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the, here these, these are, this is the square of this amplitude and these amplitudes can be evaluated as path integrals using the action that we have found. Uh, and I'll, this is a, not a seminar, so I'll spare you all the details because, but it's enough to know that because the action is, was quadratic in Q, we can do the path integrals exactly, okay? Um, so the, the relatively simple form of the action allows us to, to do an exact computation. So let me give you an aside, um, because to tell you uh, how exactly we, went, we proceeded on this, there's a famous paper in 1963 by Feynman and Vernon uh, who considered a very general problem in quantum mechanics. Uh, and what they asked was, supposing you have two interacting systems, okay, they could be anything, but we only have access to or interest in one of them, right? So this is a very standard uh, situation where you have, might have a system and an environment or, uh, uh, or whatever. Maybe you have a, a, a spin system and a detector and you can only uh, directly access the detector uh, or in this case, we have uh, a gravitational field and a detector. So what we want to know is what is the dynamics, what is the behavior, what is the physics of the system that we are interested in? So we want to know what is the effect of the other system, the system we're not interested in, on the system that we are interested in. And what Feynman and Vermin found was that uh, this effect is completely encoded by something that they called the influence functional, okay? And the influence functional turns out to be a double path integral, okay? And it's not so surprising it's a double path integral because what we end up with not probability amplitudes, but probabilities. And so since path integrals correspond to amplitudes, double path integrals correspond to probabilities. So in our context, uh, we wish to integrate out gravity to see the effect on the detector. Okay, so our system that we're not directly interested in is gravity because we don't have access to that. And what we do have access to is the length of the detector arm or that is the detector. So uh, what we end up getting is um, schematically, we have this probability in which on the right, we have, uh, we, ha we have a double path integral. It's a it's double path integral because it's a probability. Uh, in the exponent there, you can see the free particle action uh, once with a minus sign because the other part of the amplitude is complex conjugated, so that brings you a minus sign there. And then there's this capital F, that's the influence function, okay? And this capital F encodes the entirety of the effect of the gravita quantum gravitational field on the detector's eye, okay? And formally, the influence functional, as I said, is a double path integral. This is a double path integral over the gravitational field. Okay, so you can see that it's a sum over F and a double path integral over H and H prime. All right, so um, I'll simply uh, tell you what the result is. Um, we can, it's a, it's a very long but uh, and tedious calculation uh, involving a lot of use of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. Um, but when the dust settles, we have an exact expression for the influence function. 
Uh, and here it is. So this is, this is not the full influence function, it's actually only the, um, the absolute value of it, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and, it's, and it's the exponent, it's, it can be written like this, where it's an exponent uh, of some double integrals of some function a, all right, which depends on psi, the state psi, uh, and then x minus x prime, and x is really, uh, x is just um, the second time derivative of psi squared, okay? All right, so this is, so this looks, so let's try to understand what this uh, means. Now what we're gonna do, okay, so remember this form, it's an exponent of some kind, uh, and, and x appears in, uh, and you get this combination x minus x prime appears squared, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's x minus x prime basically squared. So here's a very elementary mathematical trick which is quite profound here, uh, that was uh, suggested in the paper, that was proposed in this paper by Feynman and Vernon. And we use the fact that a Gaussian integral uh, of the form e to the minus a y squared plus b y can be written as is e to the b squared over four a, which means that whenever we have the exponent of a square, we can write that as a Gaussian integral. Okay, so if I go back to our equation here, uh, this is the exponent, and there's a square in there. There's a square of the x, right? Uh, so we're going to write this as a, um, as a path, as, as a Gaussian integral, uh, except that there are additional inter time integrals here. So uh, this turns out to be not just uh, uh, the elementary case here, but it's infinite dimensional generalization, which is itself a path integral. So this, so in the, in the bottom here, you can see the trick that Feynman and Vernon uh, proposed, um, came up with. And it says that the exponent of, that this expression here, which we calculated was the, the, um, ex the absolute value of the influence functional, can be written as an additional path integral. Okay, this is very important. So there's an additional path integral in terms of this auxiliary function n. All right, so what is the meaning of this? This auxiliary function n appears in the, this path integral as there's an n squared there, okay? And the there are two integrals here. The first integral, it, uh, there are two n's there. So it's a Gaussian path integral, okay? It has zero mean and it's a Gaussian stochastic function uh, with this autocorrelation function a of t, t minus t prime. So this has the interpretation of noise. So we can take our f, Okay, and we can write it as an addition, as an, uh, in terms of this auxiliary path integral uh, over this uh, stochastic function, which basically is noise. So if we put everything together, we obtain uh, the detector transition probability, uh, and which looks like this. We have a, a probability of the detector to go from state A to state B, and that's given by a double path integral. And then finally on the right, uh, we have this uh, this expectation value of, with this this average over the function n uh, of this exponent. Okay, so this is our so there's an additional averaging going on here, which is a stochastic averaging. That's not so surprising because uh, so what has happened here? We started out with a uh, with a quantum field and. Well, okay, maybe I'll come back to this later. But let's 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 look at this equation. Uh, uh, this was a in this calculation we treated the detector also as quantum mechanical, but uh, we actually want to treat it uh, really the detector of these heavy masses, they're satellites, so we think of them as uh, well approximated as classical. So the last step, we're going to take a saddle point of this equation, which means that we're going to take the classical and and when we do that we get our result, which is uh, an equation for uh, the saddle point of this equation. And here is our result. This equation is something like, uh, it's called a, it's like a Langevin equation, which is the equation that shows up in Brownian motion. And it has, 
it, it's a generalization. We see that it is a generalization of the geodesic, classical geodesic deviation equation. And what we found is that there are now not just one term on the right, but three terms on the right. So the deviation xi is, has a um, time derivative, has a dynamics that depends on three terms. The first term on the right, the h double dot term, that's the classical gravitational wave. The last term on the right, the fifth derivative term, is the gravitational analog of the radiation reaction term, the Abraham Lorentz radiation reaction term that you get in electrodynamics. So in, uh, in ENM, the, uh, there are three derivatives. It's a three derivative term, but in, in gravity, uh, there are five derivatives because the actions are different. But most interestingly, in the middle, we have this n that we had from before, okay? The, this auxiliary function n. Uh, and, and that is quantum noise, okay? As we sort of, so, so what has happened is that we started at, so our, our equation is no longer a deterministic equation. Instead, it's a stochastic equation, and that's, sort of intuitively what you'd expect. If you couple a quantum system to a classical system and you integrate out the quantum system, well, the quantum system is still probabilistic. So the result of integrating it out will be, to, uh, will be that you will now have a classical system that will become stochastic. So that's exactly what has happened here. Uh, and this is now, this is our uh, final result. And this is the, class, the extension of the classical geodesic deviation equation for the case where the metric is a quantum field. Okay, so uh, here's what it looks like. Initially, the original picture is as, as follows. You have, uh, you have some geodesics that are, uh, so there, these are some world lines in red here. And if you have some wave Hij that's passing through, that uh, that's going to cause the uh, the the, the uh, satellites to get closer and fur further and, uh, apart and closer together, uh, and so it causes them to oscillate like this, and that's the effect of a classical gravitational wave, as given by this classical geodesic deviation equation. But now we find that this equation is no longer the case, and what we have instead is something that looks like an equation with noise. And so instead of just the original classical path, we now have a little fluctuation on top of that. Uh, and that fluctuation n is, uh, is the result of coupling to a quantized gravitational wave. So this is what we call the noise of gravitons because one way of thinking about it is that as these particle, uh, as these uh, freely falling objects are moving, they're being bombarded by gravitons, and which is what gives them some jitter. So it's a bit like Brownian motion again, where you have, uh, you have this random fluctuations that are caused by collisions with, um, in this case, gravitons. Uh, can I ask something at this stage? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you say something about this subscript psi? Uh, I guess it refers to the initial initial gravitational wave state or something like that? That's right. So the properties of the noise depend greatly uh, on the state in a, in a way that's uh, exactly calculable for a broad class of states. And we, uh, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, so we calculated uh, properties of the noise. So what do you want to know about this noise? We know that the noise has, uh, these fluctuations have zero mean. Okay, because they were a Gaussian, uh, they're Gaussian distributed. But we, what we would like to know is what's the standard deviation. So what are the variance? So like how lar what is the, how large are these? Uh, what's the, these these fluctuations? Uh, what is their magnitude? Is what's their variance? And that variance depends on on the side. We might also want to know their autocorrelation function, their power spectrum. All of those things are exactly calculable. Um, so uh, we worked it out. Uh, and um, so the magnitude of the noise depends on the quantum state as well as on properties of the detector actually. So, so here we have uh, sigma squared. Sigma is the standard deviation, so sigma squared is the variance of the fluctuation. Okay, so this is the fluctuation in the length of the arm of the detector. So if there's a detector xi, 
it's going to move according to some uh, classical, according to some gravitational wave. So that'll be the signal. But on top of that signal, there'll be a little bit of noise. And that, no that quantum noise will have a characteristic variance that depends on the state of the, of the gravitational field as well as on properties of the detector. Uh, and so that depends on, uh, so the expression is, it's, is in terms of the, the, the variance is in terms of the square of the arm, uh, the arm length, the, the resting arm length, psi naught squared, um, and also has, is an integral with some cutoff for the detector sensitivity uh, and the noise power spectrum, which is basically the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And so we can calculate this for various states, and we find that for the vacuum state and for coherent states, which are basically classical gravitational waves from weak sources, we find a ridiculously small fluctuation, 10 to the minus 36 to 10 to the minus 38 meters. Okay, so not even having very long arms is going to save you from these tiny fluctuations, which are Planck size. And that's not so surprising. Um, coherent states are sort of minimal uncertainty states. They're the, they're the most classical states you could have. And so it's not so surprising that they don't really display their quantum behavior very strongly. Uh, and so this is really the smallest fluctuation you can have. But those aren't the only states we can have in nature. Uh, and uh, there are many other uh, cases where you can have other kinds of states. In particular, uh, you could have thermal states. Now, where could you get thermal states from? You could get them from a cosmic gravitational background. Or you could get, if you're lucky, you can, uh, you, there might be an eva evaporating black hole in the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, for which the temperature can be very high, although uh, there'll be a corresponding factor that will diminish it because of the small size of the black hole. Uh, so uh, that uh, for the case of the temperature, for the case of the cosmology, um, uh, gives you a slightly better uh, fluctuation, but still very, very small and almost surely unobservable. However, you can also have squeeze states. And squeeze states are states that uh, saturate the uncertainty principle. So in quantum mechanics, you can have states that obey delta x delta p equal to h bar over two, which is a minimum uncertainty principle, uh, minimum uncertainty, but in which delta x and delta p are uh, have sort of an asymmetry in how uncertain they are. So delta x could be very small and delta p could be very large or vice versa. So that's why they're called squeezed. Um, and, and similarly, you can have squeezed gravitational states, and those are, uh, they're, they're supposed to appear in inflation um, in, from, from cosmology. Uh, and they also appear when, uh, in, they're also created, they're also the states that correspond to classical gra to, uh, gravitational waves that are created from not weak sources, but sort of in a nonlinear regime. Uh, and when that happens, there's, there's typically a sque there's some squeezing parameter R, which can vary uh, there over a large range, actually. Uh, and in that case, the sigma is exponentially enhanced in that squeezing parameter. So our best hope is that somehow nature will be kind to us and we'll have some, some access to squeeze states, uh, either through early universe cosmology or perhaps uh, through the uh, the, the last moment of binary black hole mergers, perhaps, where, there's, where strong field effects might become significant um, in a binary and spiral. So if that happens, uh, we might get lucky, with, and, and if there's a large enough value of R, then you will have an exponential enhancement, and that's the only thing that can overcome this uh, tiny effect. Of, so, so it's not... Uh, come, and so this was, we were very excited about this because it means that there, there is some possibility. Of course, we have to be a little bit lucky, um, but there is some possibility that we might have an observable. Uh, sorry, for the, for the plane wave, uh, for the plane gravitational wave, can we, I mean, I, I don't know if it is a valid question to ask, uh, just a plane gravitational wave hitting the detector, can we ask, uh, can we estimate this noise? Uh, so, uh, if it's a, a ordinary classical gravitational wave, is that, is that what you're asking? Hello? Okay. 
I don't know what's up. Hello, can anybody hear me? I don't know whether it's me or... Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Um, so if, if it's a, a classical gravitational, if it's a, if, okay, so if it's a classical gravitational wave in a coherent state, which is typically what you, put, you get from weak sources, then the, uh, the fluctuations are negligible. Um, but but uh, we might we could we could get gravitational waves from uh, in, in, that are in a nonlinear regime of gravity, uh, and in in that case uh, the, the the fluctuations could become significant. So what we basically would would probably want to do now is uh, pay more attention to the kind of noise in the uh, in the in the gravitational wave at, at arm length, uh, and by the way, as you know, there's lots and lots of sources of noise for for these detectors. But the nice thing here is that we have exactly the spectrum of them, so we sh we should be able to distinguish it from other sources of noise. So, Molly, yeah, uh, if I may ask a question, so yeah. when you talk about nonlinear gravitational wave. Yeah. And on a mechanical, you can think of them as a Swiss state. But uh, this entire analysis assumes linearized gravitational waves, right? Um, yeah, but uh, they, they'll be linearized at, at, uh, when they get here. Um, but uh, the, the state will be set by, uh, the state is set um, when they're produced. But for you, the initial state will be the state at which it, they interact with the detector, right? Um, no. So, so this okay. So you basically will have um, some quantum state that is created. That's so uh, that is created at some uh, early moment when the wave is created. Okay, and let's say that's the let's say that uh, we can arrange for that not to be a uh, coherent state, but a squeeze state because of some nonlinear effect. Uh, then that state basically evolves unchanged until it gets to us. Okay, because there's there's no interaction until it uh, until it reaches a, our detector. So we will uh, we will receive a state. We will receive a wave that um, it, that will be. Uh, it'll be a gravitational wave, but it'll be uh, but it'll be not an X. Uh, Coherent state. Uh, may I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, so the in one of the previous slide you mentioned the transition probability from a gravitational wave coming as the initial state to final state, right? So right. there is a unitarity operator you have introduced. Yes, here. No, it's before. Uh, huh, yes, the now this unitarity unitarity operator you you had t. So should we also, in, to write down the unitarity operator, should we also introduce detector as well? Because the after interacting with the detector, the, the final state well will also have the effect coming from the detector as well, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So the, unit, this, this, uh, the reason this calculation is a mess is because uh, it's an interacting theory. Uh, and so, uh, the, you have to use the full action, and basically, what you have to do is you have to separate it into a free part and, a, and, a, and, an, and an interacting part, and you go into interaction picture, uh, and then you can uh, actually, because of the form of it, you can actually calculate things explicitly without perturbation theory. But, ha, so, yeah. so yeah. now, like, can I think like this whole setup as kind of naively like the way dark matter search happens, like basically something is coming, hitting the detector, I will measure the change in the detector, and from there I can evaluate that key, whether it uh, hit it. I mean, uh, yes, the, the overall picture that we have of uh, influence functionals and so on is very general, so. Uh, so it's kind of like the same way dark matter search goes, right? Like, if, let's say beneath there is a detector, and something is coming and heating up and I know only how the detector behaves and from there I can extract information about the gravity. 
Yes, uh, you can say that. But in, in, in the case of uh, dark matter searches, um, well, I don't know how much this quantum state of the dark matter plays a role in that. But so uh, I, I don't know if it's an exactly a, well, it, it's, it's, it's roughly like that. I'm oh. not sure how, how far the analogy goes. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up here. Uh, um, so we considered the, 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 the two particles, uh, two satellites that are, that are um, whose geodesic separation is now subject to an additional noise. But actually we could have regarded one of the satellites as Earth uh, and the other one as some falling apple. Uh, and so the Earth basically you can regard it as fixed and the relative motion will now be subject to an additional fluctuation. And so this really even affects the, the geometry of uh, the behavior of falling objects. Uh, in classical free fall, according to Newton here, uh, an apple would just fall straight down to Earth. But now we have, uh, uh, due to these quantum fluctuations, we now have a quantum free fall. Uh, and here's a picture of Feynman. Uh, and I have this uh, zigzag behavior, of course, grossly not to scale, but yeah. Um, so finally, let me uh, summarize. We've developed a formalism based on the Feynman-Vernon influence functional to consider general relativity in which the space-time metric is treated as a quantum field. So there are many actual calculations we can do once we have this, because we have basically a way of, uh, you know, treating the interaction of a quantum field with uh, classical objects, uh, classical matter. Uh, and uh, remarkably, there are potentially observable quantum gravity effects even here on Earth. Uh, we'd have to get a bit lucky to observe them, um, you know, because we'd need, we need a special state of the, uh, of the gravitational field to get a sizable effect. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, it, the takeaway picture is that falling objects don't just fall straight down, but they experience this kind of jitter, this noise. Uh, whose form depends on the quantum state of the gravitational field. Uh, and I like this subject very much. It's very beautiful because it brings together uh, work done by my two heroes here, uh, Einstein and Feynman, uh, involving gravitational waves, Brownian motion, and quantum mechanics. So I was, we were very happy with this uh, formalism and the result. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot, Malik. So the floor is open for questions. So you can go ahead and ask question directly. All right. So I'll stop sharing or maybe I'll... Okay. Please ask if you have any question. So um, in your Langevin equation, if you take the gravitational wave h to zero, then are you basically getting the noise associated with virtual gravitons? If you just had two masses, they will, their relative position will be jiggling because of uh, gravitons. Yes, you can, you can take the, uh, the h to zero. Uh, and then even then, there are a bunch of states you could, uh, you could uh, have. You could have a vacuum state, in which case it's really the effect of the uh, virtual gravitons. Uh, or, um, uh, yes, or you could have some other state also. So squeeze states wouldn't have a classical gravitational wave necessarily. Uh, in fact, the, um, the interest, one of the things that we didn't, uh, that we hadn't appreciated was that you can add a, uh, so if you look at the way Glauber uh, works with coherent states in his uh, quantum optics papers, you can add a coherent state to any other state by the action of something called the displacement operator. Um, and so you don't have to have just a vac. So in other words, to get a coherent state, you can, you don't have, well, you can take a, any state, which doesn't have to be the vacuum, and act on it with the displacement operator, and get something that classically looks like a, uh, that looks like a classical uh, wave. But only if it's on the acting on the vacuum is it actually a coherent state. So uh, that's really striking because it means that 
um, well, we have access only to the, we don't directly measure the state of the gravitational field. We only measure the way objects move. Right? So whenever we measure, look at gravity, whether it's a Hubble expansion of galaxies, we can't see this expansion of the universe itself. We can only see the motion of the galaxy. Uh, and similarly, when we all follow, uh, you know, see a planetary motion again, or, or a gravitational lensing or whatever it is, we don't see measure gravity directly. We can only measure the uh, behavior of the, uh, of the, the, we can only measure the behavior of objects. And those objects all behave in the same way if there's a displacement operator acting on a state. That's the, uh, if that state did not have to be the vacuum state. So the fact that we have seen uh, effectively classical gravity around us does not mean that, uh, by itself does not mean that the state of the gravitational field is a coherent state. Uh, it could be a displacement operator acting on any other state. I don't know if that was your question, but... Uh, but you got the first part of your answer, your first part of your answer answered it. Yeah. Mr. Can I have a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, actually, my point was that uh, whenever there is a force which is acting between two particles, there should be something, uh, there should be some uh, inter interchange of the particles which is acting between them, right? Uh, for example, whenever there is a for electromagnetic force which is working, uh, which is happening between two, uh, two objects, there is an uh, exchange of some sort of particles. Yes. So whenever there is a gravitational force. So uh, let me try to see if uh, I have an image of, uh, hold on a second. Uh, I can maybe show you the what's happening here uh, in terms of. Um, okay, so. This is the um, Feynman diagram that we actually have. We have a whole, we have an infinite number of Feynman diagrams like this. So uh, on the left we have, uh, so, so the incoming states to the far, on the far left of this are uh, an incoming uh, gravitational field psi and a detector A. Uh, and then uh, at the end we have some detector state B and some field uh, F and we're gonna sum over uh, fields F, and we're also gonna sum over all such diagrams. And these vertices that you have here, they're basically graviton detector, detector vertices with some derivative couplings. Uh, and these are the only ones allowed. There are no, in, in this picture, there are no uh, graviton, graviton, or detector, detector loops. But so this is the, uh, the this is the Feynman diagram. These are, kind, these are the kinds of Feynman diagrams we, that contribute. We're not doing it by Feynman diagrams. There will be an infinite number of them. We can calculate it exactly by evaluating the path integral. So we are actually summing over all those diagrams to find out something, right? Yes. So uh, this would be the amplitude, but what we actually have is a probability, which is a square of all of these. Okay. And you can see that there are these virtual gravitons in there. Yeah, those, those spikes over there. The wiggly line, yes. Any other question? So I have a question. Like, uh, what kind of experimental scale would it require us to actually measure this fluctuation? Uh, will it be possible with LIGO or we need to get more sensitive? Well, uh, LIGO was designed with a different goal in mind, which was to detect the signal and not the noise. Uh, so uh, they found the signal spectacularly and uh, mission accomplished. Um, but now we are saying that there's also very interesting physics in the noise. Uh, and so I can imagine that uh, there will be ways to adjust the parameters of uh, LIGO. I know that there are many detector parameters that come into play uh, to, uh, if you're expecting certain kinds of noise, you might suppress, uh, 
there are ways, there may be ways to enhance the sensitivity, but this is beyond my uh, field of experience or expertise. Uh, however, the tiny fluctuations that we have right now are probably too, uh, unless they are, we get something like squeeze states, are probably too small uh, to detect and even with all kinds of experimental ingenuity. Um, so I don't know what, um, well, you know that when Einstein uh, came up, predicted gravitational waves in 1915, was it? Um, he looked at the size of the uh, strain and concluded that they would never be detected. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's no limit to uh, human ingenuity here. <laughs> hundred years later, they were detected. We might have to wait, but, but uh, uh, the um, prospects, but, but it's very exciting because this is really would be direct evidence for the quantization of gravity, for which there's actually very little evidence. We have, we have strong theoretical grounds for believing that gravity is quantized, but we have very little experimental evidence at all that, uh, that gravity is quantized. In fact, I think we have none. Uh, and uh, this would be something that we can calculate. There's um, and something that we might be able to measure and the prospects are much better than direct detection of particle um, uh, of gravitons at the LHC or something like that, which would be uh, greatly suppressed because there would be individual gravitons. So in a way, it's a bit like the way Brownian motion was discovered. Um, so Brownian motion established the existence of, of um, uh, showed that matter was discretized, that matter was made up of quanta of, uh, molecules. And it, it's, and so what happened was you, you would look at a, a pollen grain suspended in some uh, fluid and this pollen grains would have little jitters and those jitters came from the collision of, uh, of molecules and that those jitters led to a random walk which you could eventually measure. So you could not detect individual collisions of individual molecules with your pollen grain, but their collective behavior of this led to a, led to a, a measurable uh, random jitter of the, um, of the pollen grain. Uh, and this is, this is kind of similar in spirit. Instead of pollen grains, we have a gravitational of instead of, instead of um, the bombardment by molecules, you have bombardment by gravitons themselves. And we can't detect the individual gravitons, but we can detect their collective behavior, uh, which will be some kind of jitter, if we're lucky. Okay, any other question? If not, Monique, can I ask you two questions? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the, first of all, the, the even if there is no incident classical gravitational wave, this uh, noise is there, right? Because there is a vacuum around the detector, right? Yes, there's always noise. Uh, so there's... Uh, one second, am I, am I sharing or am I not sharing? I don't know what's happening. Um, yeah, there's, there's always a uh, noise. Um, uh, and the, uh, in fact, the existence of the, gra uh, of a gravitation, of a gravitational wave on top of whatever state there is, does very little to change the nature of the noise. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah. that is what is worrying me that how do you even by looking at the noise, then how do you even detect whether there is a classical wave or not? So we're not actually interested in the classical wave. We don't, uh, uh, we in fact would to get the noise, we would subtract the classical wave. Um, it, so, uh, so in fact, this, if, if the vacuum noise were larger, uh, then we could, uh, or, if there, or if there's a squeeze state, then we don't even have to wait for a classical wave, wave to arrive. If there's a squeeze state going on right now, for example, uh, then uh, although there, there would be no actual uh, detection of a signal, there will still be noise in the detector, uh, who, which would have some sort of uh, property that would match the predicted quantum uh, noise. So this has not particularly anything to do with gravitational wave detector. My, my hand will also have this noise, right? 
at this yes. stage. I mean, uh, any free falling objects uh, would, your hand is not free falling, but I if mean, you were. Uh, like uh, art, say, for example, it's really. But in a way, it's like, uh, you know, in the, in, uh, in the special, Einstein special relativity papers, he models uh, a clock by this light clock, right? But the light clock is really the essence of the clock. And it doesn't matter if we are using the light clock or a Rolex, we're still going to get exactly the same result. Uh, and in this same way, what we have as our two free falling objects is actually the essence of a gravitational detector. Uh, and so then, LIGO, okay, it's okay, harder okay. to see with LIGO because it's on Earth, but with LISA, it's very obvious that, that uh, they're just free falling satellites and, uh, and uh, yeah. They're, they're so going to have some ideas. Another thing is that this LIGO, there is this controversy when the LIGO detector came. Of course, the LIGO has answered all those controversies that there is this, uh, both the detectors have common correlated noise. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, is it possible the part of this noise is actually quantum noise? Uh... Uh, I haven't looked at, I, I know about that, of course, but uh, I haven't, uh, we'd, yeah, we haven't yet uh, looked at those kinds of uh, phenomenology. Um, that would be very fortunate, <laughs> but, but um, let's see. You know, the subject is actually not very intuitive. If you look at uh, what is the size of the graviton, yeah. so by the way, uh, uh, let me uh, say something else. A long time ago, there was a, a paper by Fre papers by Freeman Dyson, who considered the question about whether gravitational waves could ever be detected. And he concluded, or gravitons could ever be detected. And he concluded that no gravitational wave detector would ever be able to detect a graviton. And his argument was similar to, to our original story about photons. Remember, the photons really became only relevant at low light. When you have low light, you can see that the, in the spectrum of your photographs that, there's, that, there's, that there are photons. So you might expect that to see gravitons correspondingly, you would need to have a low number of gravitons. But if you actually calculate the number of gravitons in a gravitational wave, there are some staggeringly large numbers, like 10 to the 37 gravitons in a cubic uh, wavelength. Uh, so from that, uh, um, Freeman Dyson assumed that you would never be able to see the non-classicality because the occupation number was so high. But um, the mistake there, I mean, that's not wrong, but, but the, uh, the limitation there was that uh, Dyson implicitly assumed that, the, uh, that the, what were, the gravitational wave detectors would only be sensitive to coherent states. Uh, and if there are other states, then this kind of argument doesn't goes out the window. Uh, and then you have to do the calculation correctly. You can't, you can't use intuition. And an example of how unintuitive this, uh, this subject is, is if you look at the size of the graviton, it's de Broglie wavelength. Okay, so let's see, we can calculate that uh, in our heads. Uh, we know that um, lambda is equal to uh, the speed of light, gravitons travel at the speed of light, so it's the speed of light divided by the frequency. Uh, and for, for uh, LIGO, for the first black hole event, the, the frequency was about 150 hertz. So you divide 300,000 kilometers per second by 150 hertz, uh, and what you get is a wavelength of 2,000 kilometers. So these gravitons are particles that are 2,000 kilometers in size, effectively. Um, so it's it's not something that you should that you naturally think of in terms of in you know it, you you just have to do the calculation and see what you get. Okay, is there any other question? If there's no no more questions, so we we'll thank Malik for this extraordinary talk. Uh, there's a question in the chat. I don't know if okay. this is a very general question here. Uh, Well, uh, of course you need to know, well, so, so the interesting thing here is that we didn't rely on string theory or holography or 
any of the usual approaches to quantum gravity. Uh, and so most of the discussion on quantum gravity has been in the context of black holes and early universe cosmology. And what's striking here is that, uh, that, that this, is a, uh, this is physics that would appear even on Earth. And it requires just uh, treating gravity as a, a field theory, uh, which is not even a very difficult field theory because you don't have to do any loops or don't have to worry about the ultraviolet behavior of gravity. So um, you just need to, so you really need to just know field theory, quantum field theory, and, and very elementary quantum field theory as well, not renormalization and so on. That said, the quantum mechanics of it, the, Fein the Feynman Vernon uh, papers uh, are, are not what's normally taught in undergraduate quantum mechanics, and that requires some getting used to. Okay, oh, so I definitely read the Glauber papers, which are just uh, fantastic papers on quantum optics. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody for joining this seminar. Molik, thanks a lot for the talk.